Good morning and happy Thursday. <clears throat> Hello and thank you for watching this back on the replay. If you are watching back on the replay, let me know in the comments what time it is and where you are watching from. And I'm really blurry this morning, bear with me. My camera doesn't want to focus on me. Excellent. I've been having a few technical difficulties already this morning, so it's all going really well. Good morning, James Chisholm, <clears throat> and good morning all the other people that are watching me live. Wow, that's a lot of people. Ah, there we go. I'm, I'm in focus now, and I can hear you screaming, no, no, go blurry again. Um, yes, right. Okay, good morning, and welcome to this video about cognitive biases. got quite a few people watching live. Say hello. Let me know who you are. It'd be great to see you. Um, <coughs> More interesting. Well, this is the most professional start to a video I've ever done, clearly. <clears throat> Today, we're to, no, it wasn't even a big night last night, James. Um, just updates and things all at the last minute, unexpectedly. But hey-ho, we, we continue. So today I'm talking about moody memory. I'm going to be talking a little bit about how memory works. And we covered some of that in the last video last week as well, actually. So if you want to know more about memory, do go and check that out uh, on my YouTube channel or my Facebook page. And yeah, so we're going to be talking about how mood and memory are related. We're going to talk about state dependent memory and mood congruent memory bias, uh, which sounds really fancy. So I'll make sure that I explain that in better detail uh, and without using big poncy words. <coughs> <coughs> Yes, good morning. Oh, wow, look at all these people tuning in. Hi, Sue. Hi, Tristan. Hi, Facebook user. Uh, hola. Uh, hello, Emma. Good to hear from you. Anyway, uh, so that's, yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about. So let's start by, right now, I want you to think back to a memory that stands out, maybe from your childhood. Not like young childhood, but just, or any memory from the past. And the chances are, the memory you're thinking about right now, you're probably thinking far more about how you felt in that moment, the emotions associated with that time and that memory. Let me know if that's true in the comments. Let me know if the memory you're thinking back to, you can probably see it, you can probably picture it in your mind, but the chances are it's something that has an emotion attached to it and that's probably why you chose that memory and why you remember that more than potentially other things that happened around the same time so let me know in the comments if that was true for you <clears throat> i will make sure i dumb it down for the yorkshire accountant don't worry james <laughs> i know you prefer numbers to big words so <clears throat> there's a reason for this memory uh, emotion is really important to us with our memory and when we look back evolutionarily um that means like as humans have developed, simply simplifying it for James there. Um, oh, no, it's not true. Excellent. So I'm sorry, Facebook user, I can't see uh, your name. Uh, StreamYard's not allowing it. But uh, let me know what you were thinking of and what's not true about it, because that's interesting. Uh, and good morning, Rebecca. So, yes, it's, it's an evolutionary thing. It's really important. The reason that we have the emotions that we have is to help us to make faster decisions and to protect us. Ultimately, our, our, our old brain literally thinks of everything in terms of, yes, I like it and I want more of it, or no, I don't like it, I want less of it. Uh, and so for that to be an emotional trigger, the stronger the desire to get away is, the more it's going to protect you, the more necessary that is, the stronger you're going to remember that. But equally, attaching a positive emotional memory to something makes you look out for it and want more of it and makes it easier for you to find and get hold of. So that's basically where it comes from. <laughs> you were thinking more about the details around it. Am I broken? I don't work the same as everyone else. So no, you're not broken. And it's important to know, I don't know who I'm talking to, so I can't tailor this specific to you, but um, it's important Ah, hello from the Philippines. Thanks for tuning in. So it's important to note that, uh, firstly, no, you're not broken. Everyone is different, and we all have a different way of recalling information. We tend to, there are some of us that are far more visual and will picture something a lot more easily. For other people, they don't really picture it, but they feel it, and they connect on that emotional level. 
or they think about how tactile things were uh, and that's more kinesthetic is the big word that we give that um, but yeah more touchy feely um, and experiencing things that way some people are more auditory they'll remember sounds um, so it does vary and it does change um, but people are also there are people that are very much more detail orientated the chances are you remember it on some level because of an emotional attachment to it but when you recall it slightly different skill there uh, when you recall it you instantly go to thinking about the details around it because that's how you can remember it better. That's how you place yourself back there. You're a details orientated person. Oh, it's Zoe. Yeah, details. That makes sense then. Oh, or it's Mark. Okay, well, there's so many different uh, Facebook users whose names I can't see. So whoever you all are, thank you so much. And I apologize if I make an assumption on who's talking and it's someone different. <clears throat> No, Sarah, you're not broken either. No one is broken. I genuinely don't believe that there is anyone in this world that is truly broken. I don't think we need fixing. Sure, we can be improved, but that's what life is about. It's about growing and finding improvement, right? So anyway, <laughs> back on topic. Um, yeah, so emotion is really important in our memories. And in fact, there's been research and evidence, uh, re a lot of research done into memory and, and emotion and the way that they link. And when we think back to past events, we're far more likely to remember them emotionally, or at least far more likely to remember them if they had a strong emotional impact. Because if they didn't, they weren't as important to us. We'll let them go and we'll forget about them generally. When people recall their autobiography, you know, when you ask people to talk through uh, their experiences, their life, people are far more likely to talk about the emotional times. It, it seems obvious, right? You don't need to research it. Um, yeah, people are far more likely to talk about the emotional times and the things that impacted them in an emotional way, far more than the stuff that didn't. Um, and part of that will be the way that we process our memories as well. So when we sleep, when we go to our brains that are amazing things and sleep plays such an important part of it. Um, and in fact, if sleep is something you want help with, then download my free guide. Um, but yes, so so sleep is so important. And when we sleep, we process emotional memory and store that and, and work with that. We compile it in a way that we don't for other non-emotionally impactive memories, if that makes sense. So there's two things that I'm going to talk about really today. So I said this was about mood congruence, memory bias, big words. It's also about state dependent memory. The two are very closely related. They go hand in hand. There's kind of overlap between them. Uh, and I'm also going to clarify before I do that um, this can easily be confused with um, context dependent memory. And that is not what I'm going to be focusing on today. So just very briefly, context dependent memory would be or context dependent memory bias would be a tendency to remember things based on the environment, external environment that you're in. And that can have an impact on memory as well. So we're not talking about that. What we're talking about today is the way that your emotional state, your mood, the way that you're feeling can and does impact and influence the way that you remember things so a great example of this yeah okay sue has made a brilliant point there actually i teach first aid let's click that so you can see it on the screen i teach first aid from situation from sorry i teach first aid emotional recall from situation plays a huge part it absolutely does as someone who's had to use cpr in real life twice uh, with a 50% success rate, which is actually pretty good. Um, uh, yeah, the emotional memory of it is really important and it informs your actions and behaviors and how you deal with other situations. And actually staying calm in a situation is quite, in, in a stressful situation is quite important. Uh, and recalling and thinking about subconsciously how you've reacted in difficult situations in the past will inform as a bias how you are likely to react to future situations oh 
So Ash has just started her degree in psychology with criminology and has had a lecture on cognitive and biological psychology on Tuesday. Very cool. Um, so yeah, you may enjoy checking out the rest of these videos as well. There's a whole playlist. If you search for Mind Affinity on YouTube, you can find uh, the others in the series and there's a full playlist that has them all together in one place. Uh, check out the introduction that explains what they're all about first as well. So. Yes, to be fair, I've only done it twice. Uh, so I was very lucky the first time I did it uh, and not so much the second time, but there was nothing I could have done differently. So yeah, the emotional state that you're in will impact what you can and can't remember. An example of this that's been hypothesized and tested um, to some degree of success, uh, but has been challenged a lot, is alcohol. So it's not just about your emotional state naturally, but also the emotional state that you can, or, or the, the physiological state that you can be put into uh, artificially as well, synthetically, shall we say. So for example, if you get really drunk and you do lots of silly, crazy things and you wake up in the morning and you can't remember them, there's a few different things that are at play here. One is uh, the lack of sleep will have had an impact on your ability or the lack of quality sleep, which is likely after a night out will have an impact on your ability to recall, that's for sure. Um, and there's other influences along those lines as well. But if you're hungover, the chances are, normally, you're not in a very good mood. You're feeling probably quite low and lacking in energy. The night before, you were in a really good mood. You were full of energy and you were feeling really positive. So when you're in that state where you're feeling sorry for yourself, <sighs> it's harder to recall the way that you felt when you felt really good about yourself and really comfortable or confident or whatever. So if you can begin to imagine or place yourself back into an emotional state that's more similar to or more familiar to, you're more likely to remember it. This is why when you start drinking and you get to that tipsy stage and you're feeling jolly, you're suddenly able to tell loads more stories about that time when you got drunk and this thing happened. But those memories, those stories are less easy to come to you and to remember when you're not really feeling it. Uh, so I've got a comment here. I've recently had to go through delayed PTSD and it really has brought all the emotions, fears and anxieties that came with that. I actually felt I was back in that situation. It's amazing as my brain had locked that away for so long and something happened and the floodgates opened. And that is a great example. And that's why you need to be really careful and mindful of how you approach dealing with things like PTSD. Um, but it's a good thing. Recalling and remembering that and feeling like you're there again is not particularly fun, but it can form a really important part of then reframing that memory of moving on from it and of actually dealing with it better now that you're in a place where you are safe and you have the support you need around you. Um, thank you for sharing that, by the way, Rebecca. Appreciate that. Um, yes, <laughs> this is why I talk. don't talk to anyone with a, when I've got a hangover. I, if you could keep that rule, um, that would be brilliant. Yeah, don't, don't talk to me when you're in a bad mood. That would be excellent. Um, so, so if you want to remember something, getting into the emotional state that you were in at that time will make it easier to remember. So how can you learn, knowing this, how can we use this to our advantage? Because there's, it's, it's all, it's great learning new knowledge and being able to understand the mind better, but it's so much more useful if we know how we can then implement that, if we can take something positive from that to use it differently. So, yeah, it, uh, another example there, it can go the other way with anger, uh, with the drink side of things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there, there are positives and negatives to this, obviously, or, or things that are seen as being more positive or more negative from it. Uh, it helps you recall emotional memories. They could be good emotional memories or they could be difficult emotional memories. It's still the same bias. So... <clears throat> Here's a way that you can really use that to your advantage. When we're trying to think about our values, for example, or we're trying to think about what we want to do, 
that could be big questions like what you want to do in life, what's important to you, um, you know, what what's what's next when you're at a crossroads, for example, and you're in that emotional state where you just don't know and you're confused or you're unsure or you're uncertain, then you're going to be remembering other times, not necessarily consciously, but you're going to be associating with other times when you were uncertain and unsure and undecided. And in that mood and in that situation, it's hard to make decisions. And you'll be remembering what it's like for it to be hard to make decisions. And you'll be knowing and remembering that that's not something that you enjoy, which makes it even harder to make the decision you wanted to make in the first place. What you can do in this situation is start by changing your state. Now, that's not just to, that's not to say you can just go, oh, it's fine. I'm not going to worry about the thing that's making me unhappy. I'm just going to think happy thoughts and everything will be wonderful. Life's not quite as simple as that. But rather than choosing to ignore or push down the way that you're feeling, accept the way that you're feeling, but decide temporarily to focus on something else. Good morning, Sam. Focus on something positive. Focus on something or think about something. Recall a memory that gets you into a positive state. Just try and think back to a time when you felt clear when you were device, decisive, decisive and you found it easy to make a decision and feel confident in that decision. Think about times when you've already made decisions and how clear that felt afterwards, how good you felt afterwards. And when you remember that and put yourself into that state and begin to feel that way, then it's going to be much, much easier to make a decision because now you're remembering times when you've been able to do that in the past. And that informs your behaviors and, and, the, and your actions, leading to being able to make clearer, easier decisions. So in summary, memory is a, a fascinating thing. There's so many different elements to it. Please check out my last video where we spoke a lot more about memory as well and how that works. Um, state dependent memory or mood congruent memory bias is a simple trait that we have as humans where it's far easier for us to remember something, a situation, for example, when we are in a, in the same or similar emotional state. So when we're feeling happy, it's easier for us to remember happy things. When we're feeling sad, it's easier to remember sad things. What this also does, and another part that plays into it that's worth considering, is that if we're in a bad mood, for example, then we're far more likely to notice things that make us feel bad. And then when we look back on that situation, and actually during that situation, we'll be noticing and highlighting and remembering and recalling all of the elements of that situation that made it feel bad, but not necessarily remembering the parts of that situation that were good or positive or enjoyable so yeah that's basically what it's all about psychologists have actually started to say that there is some tox toxic optimism because it means people aren't feeling the negative emotions like i think that's meant to be grief properly which can be detrimental to mental health yeah absolutely this is something i've been saying for a while that toxic optimism or toxic positivity um the thing is, everything's about balance, right? Balance is really important. And it's all well and good to say, oh, positivity is good. Well, positivity is good. There's lots of studies that show that thinking positively and being in a positive state is congruent to achieving better things and feeling better and an and, and improvement in mental health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not the same as only ever allowing yourself to feel positive. I personally, this is off topic, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. I personally don't view negative emotions as being a negative thing. When I'm sad and I cry, yeah, that sucks. I'm not going to pretend that that's a pleasant experience in itself, but it's part of who I am and it's part of being human. And if those things didn't impact me, like if you listen to Buddha, then the idea would be to get to a point where those things didn't affect you and you didn't feel sadness. But the aim would also be to get to a point where you don't feel joy either. It's about being completely neutral to what's happening around you. 
uh, yeah, okay, that's something to strive for, but it seems like a bit of an overreaction to, to bad stuff to me. Wouldn't it be better to, for me at least, you may disagree and that's fine, please let me know if you do, but wouldn't it be better to actually experience life, to live in those moments, to feel that joy when things go well and to feel that sadness when things don't? I've learned and grown far more from situations where I've experienced negative emotions than I have from when I've been feeling good. The challenges and difficulties that I've had to overcome have allowed me to learn, to grow, to develop, and to be able to deal with bigger and other things down the line. When I feel sad, I accept it for what it is, and to some extent, I actually I kind of do enjoy it, not because it feels nice to be sad, although sometimes it is fun to wallow, let's be honest, um, but because I, I, I view it with curiosity. I like to pay attention to how I'm feeling and the way that it's impacting me, which instantly makes me a bit more objective about it, which means I'm allowing myself to experience those emotions without those emotions being on top of me, if that makes sense. It's like if I stub my toe, I'm not in pain, my foot is in pain which gives me some distance from it, allows me to notice it and experience for what it is. I'm still feeling that pain, but I'm able to manage my reaction to it. And that's the same thing with emotions. I don't, you can't, in my opinion, you can't control your emotions and it's dangerous to try and do so. And there's a lot of self-help <clears throat> people that would suggest otherwise. Um, and it, it just, to me doesn't work it's just a, another source of increasing anxiety when you think that you should be able to control your emotions but you can't it just generally makes it several times worse what you can do is control the way you react to those emotions and in doing so you have the power to influence how you're going to feel in the future that's where the magic happens um this is where why employers need to realize that mental health first aid is so important, ever more so in these days of COVID. So you're right, mental health first aid is important. Do you know what's even more important in my opinion? And of course I would say this because it's part of what I do as a business. But when you look at the physical health in the workplace, you look at, you do, you start with a risk assessment. You start by assessing what are the chances of something going wrong and someone getting hurt? If it does go wrong, how wrong will it go? And how severe will it be? Then you look at how can I minimize all of the different elements of this risk? You also then make sure that you've got first aid as, as a way of minimizing the impact of that risk if something does go wrong. But first, you want to try and reduce the chance of it going wrong at all to begin with. So I believe that workplaces have a responsibility not just to have mental health first aiders that are able to deal with a situation if it arises, but they should be proactive about ensuring that their workplace is conducive to supporting positive mental health within their workforce. Wouldn't the world be a better place if people actually felt valued and supported at work? Plus, it's really good for the business because it improves productivity, reduces absenteeism, and uh, reduces staff turnover. Anyway, <clears throat> having a positive outlook doesn't mean you're happy all the time and bad things aren't going to happen to you. You have no control Yep, you have no control over that. It's about not catastrophizing the bad bits. Spot on. I'm guessing that's Zoe. Um, I've done this a lot this week, accepted that I've said that I need to cry and that it's part of the process. I'm sorry to hear that, but also glad that you're embracing it for what it is. Even a happy life cannot be without a measure of darkness. Um, and the world and the word happy would lose its meaning if not balanced by sadness. Carl Jung. Absolutely. Spot on. Um, you know, would you appreciate the daylight if it was never dark? Would you, if, if you're so, I personally, I love autumn, but would I love it as much if summer wasn't as hot, for example? I don't know. More, a more easy to understand example is for those people who love summer, would you love it as much if you didn't go through the winter and then get to the summer. Um, it does make a lot of sense. 
we don't do this for mental health. Uh, yeah, so I, I think you're referring to workplaces being proactive. Um, yeah, you can though, because that's something that Mind Affinity offers. So get in touch if you have or know of companies that want that kind of proactive approach to looking after the mental health of their staff and their well-being. Get in touch. Um, acceptance. Acceptance is a, a really important thing in general. Uh, summer rocks, but autumn's better. Autumn's definitely better. Um, okay, thank you everyone for all your comments and interactions. It's been great to see so many people there. Risk assessment, yeah, so that's exactly what I do. I do um, a workplace well-being assessment, I call it, which is basically a risk assessment looking at what the potential triggers and challenges and difficulties are within the workplace and how they can be improved. If you want to know more, Sue, just get in touch. Um, yeah, awesome rocks more, spot on. Team Autumn. Okay, so thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, it's been great to have so much interaction today and I look forward to catching you all next week. Oh, I've actually planned in advance. I can tell you what next week's video is going to be about. <gasps> so next week's video is it's going to be another memory bias we're looking at. So even more understanding of the memory and how we remember stuff. Uh, we're going to be talking about serial position effect. And no, that's not to do with where you store your shreddies. Um, serial position effect uh, is a memory bias that uh, kind of instructs us or helps us understand how we remember which elements of an experience we remember. And that's all I'm going to say about it now, because to find out more, you'll have to tune in next week, Thursday, nine o'clock. You'll find uh, you'll find I'll, I'll pop the link in the comments here ready for next week. Uh, once it, it once it's scheduled, you can find it on my YouTube channel channel and my Facebook page. Thanks everyone for tuning in and you're very welcome. I'm glad you found it interesting. Remember to check out my previous videos. Thank you. Goodbye.